this morning out of an article that I read. I wanted to preach a message that's called um, Trusting Without Knowing. Trusting Without Knowing. Uh, it's easy to trust, isn't it, when you know. It's easy to trust. You, we hop in our car, we turn the ignition on, and we just know it's going to start until it doesn't. And then we trust in the Lord that he will get that car to the car yard on time and the car will work as you trade it in for the next one. Isn't that right? For a certain couple in our church who God does a miraculous things. And so we trust and we grow in trust in a lot of times in things that we do. Um, I want to put this picture up on the screen. This picture is of some people know already, uh, but this is a picture of, oh no, yes, my office chair. That is my office chair. That chair, you may tell by the pattern on there. Let's see if I can see everyone on the screen for those at home can watch as well. And so this is, this is the office chair that I got. This chair is 29 years old. 29 years old. And when I first got this chair, I didn't really like it because look at the pattern. It's ugly. I didn't like the chair. It had a smell to it. It had this musty smell and I went, I really don't like this chair. And not only did it have a musty smell, every time you tipped it, these, you know when wasps get in something and you've got wasp mud, all the mud from the wasps, all this mud would fly out and I'd go on, this chair at some stage of its life has been outside for a long time. Now, I didn't buy that chair. This chair was my dad's chair. This was my dad's office chair and, and I inherited this chair 10 years ago. When my dad passed away, my brother said, H, you've got the nice writing bureau from dad. You need a chair to go with it. Take this chair. And, and I, I did. I grabbed the chair and, and the reason I love this chair is because of this. It can tilt back. And I love to read when I'm, when I'm just going over stuff. I tilt back and I read and I look at the computer screens and I can swivel around and I can lean back, look forward. It's not just the backrest that leans back, it's the base of the chair that tilts as well. It became very, very comfortable. And after a while, Ella, the smell went away. After a while, no more mud came out of it. And the chair really did become my favourite chair. And I trusted that chair that I could lean back on it and everything would be okay until it didn't. No photo of that. <laughs> one day, one morning, um, it just snapped at the base. It snapped and the chair fell on the ground, me on the ground with it. I'd leaned too back, far, back too far too many times and the chair broke. So I searched and searched and searched and I looked to find, I took Sue with me to Officeworks and I said, what kind of chair? And I did find a chair. I found a chair like that. It was, it's comfortable. The back really leans back and so I can lean back again, but the base didn't tilt. It just wasn't the same. And I, I'd only had it 10 years, but what it turned out as a chair that I didn't like, turned into a chair that I absolutely loved and it's, uh, I just loved sitting in that office chair. It was comfy. I, I just knew where I was and, and I could trust, couldn't trust that chair. And so at a point of time, I had a thought that my dad would have had. I looked at this chair. I looked at it outside as it's ready to go to the tip. And I thought, I can fix this chair. I can fix this chair. And so I did. I did. Now, bear with me. I have not touched, and for those online, please be kind. I have not touched a welder in probably 20 years. I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to grab a bit of plate underneath and where it, had, it did snap right on the bend, I bolt a plate to it and I fix it. And so I did that and, and it was a lot of effort getting the plate. I was telling Dan how many drill bits I went through because it was hardened steel on the chair. And I put a plate underneath it, I had it going, and I sat in the chair the first time, uh, and I leant back, but you're leaning back very tentatively. I wasn't sure I could trust the chair anymore. Well, after one day, I realised I had good reason not to trust the chair anymore, because 
where I'd fastened it wasn't good enough. I fastened it on the pivot point and that one plate of steel bent. And so the chair, I thought, this is just going to keep breaking again. I thought, I need to come up with a better idea. And I thought, what would my dad do? And so this is what my dad would have done. He grabbed that two pieces of plates and I thought, what I need gus it on the plate, weld it on there so that it's impossible for it to bend because of that right angle plate. So I grabbed the welder out. I didn't show my neighbour across the road because my neighbour across the road is a welder and if he saw me welding he would have gone, Harry what are you doing? What are you doing? And so I fixed this up and I put the plate on there and lo and behold it worked. It worked. And but I have to say that every day, even to this day, I sit in the chair and I lean back a little bit just to see if I'm going to be able to trust, not the metal, I'm seeing if I trust my workmanship. I'm seeing if I trust what I have done. And I'm making sure that, is it bolted right? Is everything going to work? You can see where it was cracked at the top. And so this is... Throughout the month, I, I had a bit of a lesson of trust. Can I trust the chair? And there's a saying that says, trust can take years to build, seconds to break, and forever to repair. How true is that? Can take years to build, seconds to break, and forever to repair. Uh, trust cannot be demanded. It's received freely. It's given with an effort, but it's given to others. But it's up to those who want to receive trust, whether we receive trust into our lives. Who knows the great author, Ernest Hemingway? He put it very simple. He said, the best way to find out if you can trust somebody is to just trust them. If you want to learn to trust, trust somebody. I like what Corrie ten Boom said. Corrie ten Boom said, that never be afraid to trust, and look at that line, unknown future to a known God. Isn't that awesome? Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. And from that, it brings us to a great scripture in Ephesians 3. three Ephesians 3, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. This scripture is a scripture and statement not just of faith, but one of trust, trusting in God, in Jesus Christ, that we will be and are truly saved. There was an article that I was reading which sort of put this message together because there was something which I mentioned last week that caught my eye. This news article was written and released on Christmas Day last year and here's some things that caught my eye. The death of God is a loss of trust. The death of God is a phenomenon throughout the West. It tracks a loss of trust. Have people lost trust in God? Have Christians lost trust in God? Another headline on the article said that looking for God in all the rock places are Australians craving spiritual connection. I really believe the answer is yes. I think Australians are craving spiritual connections. The article was written by a well-known journalist who I won't mention, as I said, on Christmas Day last year. And it was about a rock musician, a performer, who I won't mention his name either, but he had over the years two of his sons and he had found God the article said although it says he doesn't profess to be a practicing Christian he certainly found a faith and a belief in God and here are some things that I felt stood out in the article that I wanted to highlight so if you wouldn't mind I, I'm going to have this for those at home as well where I'll just read out what the bits that he said so this is the article I saw this artist perform at the Sydney Opera House. The room was transformed. This was no mere concert and nothing resembling anything as inconsequential, albeit entertaining, as a rock band. This was a religious experience. 
I mean religious, not spiritual. Something more, something demanding. A thing of ritual and discipline. A thing of darkness and light. The other thing is religious. Spirituality isn't enough. I agree, right? There's an oft heard contemporary phrase I'm spiritual, but not religious. That speaks to a modern melee. It is something short of commitment, something tried on for size. It sounds like a lifestyle. It felt, he's talking about a concert, it felt like an old time Pentecostal revival show, which I wondered has this journalist actually been to a Pentecostal meeting? I dare say he has because he would then understand. It felt like an Old Testament, uh, an old-time Pentecostal revival show. I sensed a space between the religion that the artist speaks of and the desire of men in the audience for some connection. They wanted a personal touch from the rock star. He continues to write this. But they did not want a touch of God. But did they want a touch of God? Some, perhaps, many, like me, no doubt, would have. But I could not help but think that many, if not most, in the audience would have been more comfortable with a spiritual experience. This was a secular audience. How many of those with their hands outreaching would likely be found in the pews of church? And there's a picture of him standing there People's lifting their arms, wanting to touch his hands, and I'm sure, was you already know who this guy is. The journalist continues to write, Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor once chronicled what he calls the secular age. He says that we have seen the rise of exclusive humanism. We have swapped God for a culture of authenticity or expressive individualism in which people are encouraged to find their own way, discover their own fulfillment, and do their own thing. This has not been without its gain. It has brought liberation. It has freed us from the worst of dogma and faith-sanctioned bigotry. But does the secular world answer the questions of a yearning for something more? Does the secular world of yearning for something more. I, obviously, I don't believe it does because they're looking for a spiritual connection in a place where they cannot get a spiritual connection. But I did find this article to be incredibly honest, thought-provoking. I think the writer may have been trying to say that many Australians are yearning for a spiritual freedom a spiritual encounter, a spiritual freedom and an encounter of faith, certainly a spiritual freedom and encounter of culture, personal culture, a spiritual freedom and encounter that's free from the traditional clutches of church and most likely one that doesn't touch or cost your hip pocket. A spiritual encounter where the deity of what you believe fits in to the cultural and social parameter that I, myself, me, has set. I will worship today what, who, and how I want to find my freedom determined by what I think my freedom is because it's my basic human right. The Bible speaks into that in the Old Testament in Judges 21. 25. And in Judges 21, 25, it tells us, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right. Where? What did every person do? Right according to his own eyes. So much like society today. That man will do and worship according to his own eyes. But the key is the first part of that scripture, because there was no king. Many believers, in the Western world at least, have often understood Jesus as saviour, 
but have never understood Jesus as Lord. That I'm willing to give my life to a saviour who will save me from the pit of hell because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short. And when we've fallen short, the penalty and the wages of sin is death. But as we heard this morning from Pastor Norell about the love of God that goes before us. I'm reminded when it comes to trusting about the story of King Saul in 1 Samuel 13 and then again in 1 Samuel 15. That King Saul didn't want to wait for the prophet Samuel. That he was there and he needed to give a sacrifice to wait for the instruction of God and he couldn't wait for Samuel to turn up. And we wa- he just waited and waited and it didn't happen quick enough. I kind of relate to that. I want things now. I want things instant. I want to see God do things in my time. He couldn't wait. So Sam, uh, King Saul did what he thought was the right thing to do. He just did the sacrifice himself. And Samuel comes up and said, what have you done? Why did you do this yourself? And he said, the king stayed with you forever but now it'll go to another who has a heart after God. Two chapters later, he was given an instructions to kill off the Amalekites. And if he had done what he was supposed to do, we would never have heard and read about the story of Hagag, of um, Esther and Mordecai and, oh, what's the guy from Agag? Haman, thank you. And Haman was a descendant of the Amalekites. Saul didn't do what he was supposed to do. He had that scripture that comes out of his disobedience and you look at it and you think, well, really, all he did was make a sacrifice. Really, all he did was um, not kill someone. You look at the other kings and you think they did so much worse and yet Saul had the kingdom taken away because he didn't trust in what God was doing. He didn't trust in what was before him. And we have the scripture, of course, that to obey is better than what? Sacrifice. And we learn in these lessons that, you know, that we have to trust God in the fullness and not reinterpret. I personally am delighted. I'm enthusiastic. I have anticipation for us as Christians today that we are in a society that I believe is ready to hear the truth of God. And that's why I pray Isaiah 65, 1 all the time. I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek for me. God said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. And there are plenty of people that we know that have not been called by God that are not looking for God. The promise about God is, I will let myself be found by anyone who desires to know me. Trusting God as so often can be an issue when we feel, we feel our world has been filled with disappointments, being let down. Have you ever prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing happened? Have you ever just put everything before God and said, I've got nothing left, God. I'm praying for you. I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. And nothing has happened and happened. And yet I think Christians, if they were honest with themselves, would even say at one point or another, perhaps just entertain the thoughts that I think I was let down by God. And even those words as we think it in our minds to go, oh, that's what a blasphemous statement. How can I say that? I'm a born again Christian. I'm alive in the power of God. And yet I am certain that every believer at some point or another has found themselves in a place where they feel, I just feel let down by God. Trusting without knowing is to trust God even when we don't get the result we want. Even when we don't get the result we want, because so often we find that our trust can be based on getting what we want. The real test of trust and faith I have found so often is in God's timing. Not my timing, God's timing. We know that there's a saying that God is 
never light. Have you heard that? God is never light. He's seldom early, but never light. God is seldom early, but never, ever light. His timing is not my timing. His plan is not my plan. And so often we want to experience God and understand God in, in the timing of what we see. And when we look at the story of Abraham and Isaac, we see a story of trust, a story of faith. But the story is based upon a point. And in verse 4 of Genesis chapter 22, on the third day, the Bible tells us, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw a place afar off. And Abraham said to his son Isaac, and you know the story, that he was going away to worship, to sacrifice his son, that that's what God had asked. And before you get all at, oh, how could he ever do that? We were living in a culture where that was not quite normal. It was quite normal. As normal as if the sun's shining, head to the water. As normal as if you try and go on the M1 after 10 o'clock on a Saturday, it's a car park. It was as normal as that. that you, yeah, you just know that's what it's going to be like. And so he was asked to sacrifice his son, which was not uncommon. And so he's going there. But Abraham had a trust in God and he sees the mountain far off and he said, that's the point. That's the crux. Everything we're believing is going to come to a point right at that spot. And I believe when I get to that spot that God is going to do something and he's taking his son and he's walking up to this mountain and he had no idea that as he was walking up that mountain that God's provision was walking up on the other side of the mountain. Abraham didn't see the trust that God had. He didn't see the plan, I should say, that God had. All he had was the trust in his inheritance that God said, I will make you a father of many nations how does that work if I've got to kill my son? And he walks up the mountain with a trust and he says to his son, God will, in verse 8, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. If it was me, Dan, walking up that hill, I would be looking for a lamb. And if it was me, I probably would have gone, he wants me to do something. I've got an inkling that God's going to sacrifice a lamb. You know what? Maybe I should just bring a lamb with me just in case. And I'd prepare a little bit and I'll bring a lamb with me and I'll, I'll just lead it along. I, I'd cover its eyes because you don't know want, it, want it to see where it's going to. And so you're leading up the hill and as you're taking up it, that's not how God works. And at that point in time, when he was about to do everything in obedience, he wasn't a, come on God, come on. I think Abraham held nothing back from God. Such was his trust in God. And as he was about to bring the knife down, the Lord speaks and he reveals a new aspect of himself. And he said, my name is Jehovah Jireh. I will provide. I will provide. And he gives him a foundation that anything that happened later on in his life, he'll remember God told me his name at right at that point when I need it. It didn't happen as we were walking. It didn't happen as he gave me the dream. It didn't happen as I went up the hill. It didn't happen when I was getting the fire ready. It didn't even happen when I put the, my son on the altar. It didn't happen as I was about to, as I, but as I was about to fulfill and do, God speaks. Abraham showed a trust that it'll be there when you get there. When you're waiting on God for things, it will be there when you need it and it'll be there when you get there. Abraham and Isaac both have to have a trust in their father. Isaac trusted his, heavenly, his earthly father and Abraham trusted his heavenly father. We know God is never late. But I have to say, it's not how it always seems, is it? It's not always how it seems in the natural. We don't see the big picture, God's master plan. God seemed late for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. He was late. But God wasn't late because it was in the fire that they met the fourth man. God seemed late for Daniel. 
God seemed late for Daniel as he's being charged and thrown into the lion's den. But God wasn't late because he used King Darius' decree to change the fate of the nation of Israel. God seemed late for Joseph twice. He seemed late in the natural. It looked like it was done. It looked like his life was destined for prison, but God was not late. He was at the right point, at the right time, and at the right moment for when Pharaoh has the dream and who can interpret it, that the right person is standing in the right position next to Pharaoh with the right memory that says, oh, forgive me, Pharaoh, I should have remembered this two years ago. But if he said it two years ago, Pharaoh didn't have the dream. God certainly seemed late for Lazarus. Well, it's certainly in the eyes of Mary and Martha. God seemed extremely late. In fact, he was four days late. Four days late. And one of my favorite verses, he stinketh much. He stinketh much. But God wasn't late when the people saw the miracle of life returning into Lazarus. Do we trust God in his timing? Do we trust God in his timing? I, I think of Matthew chapter 14 and um, we had dinner with Peter and Kath, Doc, and they, uh, Peter sent me a pictures. Peter, if you're watching this later, thank you. He sent me exactly the same pictures of Matthew 14. Jesus is with his, the disciples. It's getting late. And as it's getting late, the disciples said to Jesus, send them away. Send them away, Jesus because we don't have anything here to feed them. And Jesus said, we just got a few fish. And Jesus says, it's not late. Feed them. You know the story where he feeds the 5,000 and he blesses them. And straight after that, that they're fed, he instructs his disciples. And while the Bible doesn't say explicitly, I will meet you on the other side, it's certainly an implication because he'd never left them. So he said, you get in the boat, you go to the other side. And of course, Jesus was going to meet them there. If Jesus said, you go, and by his instruction, you go, there's obviously an implication, I will meet you. Because he'd met them everywhere. So we know the story in Matthew 14 that these disciples are in the boat and they're rowing and rowing and rowing and rowing and a storm came up. And it says in about the fourth hour of the morning, in the early hours of the morning, as they're trying to row nowhere, they see what appeared to be a ghost. And they cried out in fear. I find it interesting because the storm didn't make them afraid. The seasoned fishermen. The storm didn't make them afraid. But they saw what appeared to be a ghost. And they cried out in fear. And it was the Lord. And as Jesus is coming to them, Peter makes this bold statement. And he said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out of the boat. Peter just didn't jump out of the boat. So often we do things in God and we just jump out. But he needed the word of the Lord first. And Jesus gives him the command and said, Peter, come out. And we know the story for as long as his eyes were focused on Jesus, as long as his eyes were focused and his trust was in Jesus, he was walking on water. But the moment he saw his circumstance, he focused on circumstance, of course, we know that he was starting to sink. And there's the promise, of course, that Jesus there grabbed him and lifts him out. See, the challenge is not, will God meet us on the other side? The challenge is always, how long do we have to wait before he gets there? How long do we have to wait before God comes through? How long do we have to wait before he answers our prayer? How long do we have to wait? And unlike Abraham, who saw a destination and went, well, this is a point, the disciples were waiting and they had no idea how long it was going to take him to cross. See, sometimes in God, sometimes in God, He'll bring us through things that gets us into a brand new chair. It changes things. 
and our trust moves in that. But sometimes trusting God means you've got to get the welder out. You've got to go to Bunnings and buy some parts several times. And you've got to do some repairs to strengthen what you already have. See, I've I found that most of the time God has already equipped me. But he's strengthening what's already inside. And he brings me through seasons of learning to trust without knowing. Trusting him when I don't have the answer. You know what that's like, Belle. Trusting him when you can't see what's at the other side. When you don't know how long it's going to take you to get to the other side of the lake. When you don't know if everything's going to be okay when you get there. When you don't know if you're going to be better off or worse off. And trusting God that he is able to do it. Amen? I love what David writes in Psalm 9. And those who know your name. And those who what? Know God's name who have experienced your precious mercy, will put their confident trust in you. David doesn't just say, will put their trust in you. Their confident trust in you. Their utmost trust in God, O Lord, O Lord, for you, O Lord, have not abandoned those who seek you. Why is it important to trust God? Why is it important to trust God regardless of your circumstance? Why is it important to trust without knowing? I think of that scripture again in Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved. And not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. When we accept Jesus, why is it important? When we accept Jesus, we give up doing things our way. When I accepted Jesus into my life, I gave up my rights. And the reason I gave up my rights is oftentimes I think a bit of a misconception and, and we don't understand what's happening. I gave up my rights to self because the wages of sin is death. And without Jesus, every person, every person, past, present and future, Well, I won't say who will and who won't go to hell, but the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And without Jesus, we aren't washed. We don't have his blood. Without Jesus, we don't have that place where we are walking in the blood of Jesus. And because of that trusting God, because of that uh, what he has done for us, because he has made a way and it is a gift, it's because I'm a Christian. Why is it important to trust God? I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of the way. I'm a disciple of Jesus. That's why it's important to trust him. The moment may not always feel good. It may not always look great. It may not always appear that it's going to work out. But I've learned that when I learn to surrender my wants and my desires, my fears, my concerns, and leave it at the foot of the cross, I'm able to demonstrate a complete trust in God. Trust God, trust Jesus, trust the Holy Spirit. See, to trust God with everything we have, I'm learning is a lifetime journey. A lifetime journey. And whether you meet a preacher who's just got into the ministry or if you were to sit down with someone like the amazing Jack Hayford who passed away not so long ago, that the ones who've been in the Lord for a long time will be able to tell you exactly the same thing. I'm still learning. I'm still understanding. I'm still changing. I'm still transforming. I'm still learning to trust. I'm still learning to give more to Jesus. 
I'm still learning to lay it down at the cross. I'm still learning to surrender my will, my wants, my desires, and trust that God has my best in his heart. God doesn't have your worst in his heart. God doesn't have your nothing in his heart. God has your best in his heart. For the God that says you are fearfully and wonderfully made, a God that could say, I knew you before you even thought of and before you were even fashioned in your mother's womb, I know you. And I've placed my purposes and my destiny upon you before you were even thought of. That's a God worth trusting. That's a God worth knowing. That's a God worth understanding. And to prove that he loves me, the Bible says, Pastor Narelle said this morning, for God love the what? Is there any exclusions? For God so loved the world. I find that statement incredibly amazing. I don't always love the world. I don't always love people who do me wrong. I don't always love people who do mean and rotten things. I don't always love people who I think shouldn't deserve it or shouldn't get it. That in my natural, I don't. But with Christ, I begin a journey. He loves everyone. That's a God worth trusting. So throughout 2023, how's your trust levels? Have you sat in the chair of trust and the backrest snapped off? Fell on the ground in a mess. Has God told you to get the world out? Or as God says, I'm going to give you a new chair. And it's going to look a bit different, feel a bit different, but I'm going to give you a new chair for there's new things that I'm placing because there's new places of trust. Trust. Trust God. Trust Jesus. Trust the Holy Spirit. Could we stand this morning? Hallelujah. I, I, I don't really believe, it's, it's not really a message that we can exclude, say anything, but I, I just want you to pray to yourselves this morning and I want to challenge you this morning, do you want to learn to trust God more? Yes, it's a loaded question because you can't, you can't say trust God more without tension coming in without leaning back on that chair and going, this could snap at any time. You can't trust God without actually experiencing things that make you want to trust. We trust him because he loves us. We trust him because of who he is. We trust him because he is our everything and our all. And the Bible says his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are are higher than my thoughts. And I have a promise, as the Bible says, no ear has heard, no eye has seen, no tongue has confessed what God has in store for us, for you and for me. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you this morning that we can trust you. I thank you this morning that we can place everything that we have. And I pray, Holy Spirit, for those here and for those online, That, Lord, if there is areas in our lives right now that we need to yield and surrender to you. Can we just pause for a moment? I want you to think of areas right now where you need to hand over to God. Forgive us, Father, for any areas that we've held back and placed our trust in ourselves and in our own hands. We give to you our lives. You are Lord of all. So my prayer this morning is increase our capacity, increase our understanding, increase our heart that it would soften And we would yield to you in everything and trust you with everything. That we can rejoice, 
that we can cry out in praise and declare, you are God of all. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you, Lord. So I pray that prayer upon everyone here this morning, for those watching online, that this year, 2023, would see an increase of trust, an increase of faith, an increase of things, oh God. We're able to stop and say, God's got this. God has got this. No matter what the circumstance, God has got it. And he will bring us through. And even though we cannot see the other side, we trust that you will get us there and whatever we need will be there when we need it. So we just thank you and praise you this morning in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.